looking at something that I call remembering our redemption. Remembering our redemption. And, and, and there, there's a relevant reminder. And, and as, I, as I express that, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 12. We're going to take one look at Exodus 20. We'll look at Mark 14 and 1 Corinthians 11. And we're not going to spend an enormous amount of time in any one of those passages because we're going to get the the summary feel of what they're saying. But the reality is, is this morning we're celebrating the cup and the bread. And the reminder that they are of what Christ did for us. And in, in view of that, I, I want to just ask a few questions here to start. Communion. I, for some reason or other through the years, I have avoided using the word Communion. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. I'd rather use the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. That's the term that I typically use, but yet I hear everyone else, most everyone else, they say, we're celebrating communion. We're going to have communion. There was a time years ago, I was actually pastoring in Bay City, Michigan, and and I I made the statement to a couple folks, and they said, well, we're going to celebrate communion next Sunday. Celebrate? We don't celebrate when we take communion. And I stepped, wait a minute now, what do you mean we don't celebrate? This is a celebration of Christ's provision for us. But now, the question is, how important is it? You know, there are some churches, some places where they look at this as a way for us to gain our salvation. Some people believe that. They think, and and some of you young people, when you're in school or whatever else, you're going to rub shoulders with People that have all kinds of beliefs, some people don't even have a care about this, but there are some churches where they teach that when you take communion, you are exa- actually you are receiving your salvation. That's the way they get your salvation. And I want to say this morning that that's not true. That makes it important in a way that it, it, it isn't true. It, it's not what really happens. But it's important because the Lord told us to do that. Why is it important? Well, because God commanded it. But because it is a memorial. It is is there for the purpose of us reflecting on what He did for us. And as we go back a little bit, step forward a little bit more, what does it mean? What, what does the bread mean? The bread represents, we're going to look at this in, in the Scriptures a bit, that represents the body of Christ. The cup represents the blood that He shed on Calvary. And we, I think we all know that, but yet we stop and reflect on that for a minute and say, okay, yeah. It's symbolic. It is. And I'll just say there are some churches that believe, in fact, there are some churches where they ring a bell And when they ring that bell, they believe that that bread literally becomes the body of Christ. And and I find it interesting, there are a lot of folks, there are folks here that that kind of sort of believe that in this church. But I've searched the Scriptures and, and I don't find anywhere in the Bible where it says that's what happens. That isn't something that the Bible teaches. The Bible clearly expresses that it's a memorial. It's symbolic. And it reminds us of the body and the blood of Christ. But why do we do this? Once again, we do this to follow God's directions. He told us that's what we're supposed to do. Now, there's a concern that I have. In fact, the church where I grew up, they only did it four times a year. And their reasoning was the same reason why some athletic teams don't play the national anthem before every game. And that's because it gets old. It gets ritualistic. It gets go through the motions. Now, there are some churches that celebrate it every Sunday. And I'm not going to argue one way or another. The Bible says that as often as you do this, No time frame is given to us. But as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until His second coming. And that's what it says. So that's why we do it. But now, 
as we try to identify what, what's our focus today? What, what are we really trying to see? And this is very simple. But God has established for us, and throughout history, God has established what I would call relevant reminders. These are gifts that He gives us to some extent. They're relevant reminders that will encourage the faith of His followers. That's what it's all about. It's a relevant reminder that encourages the faith of those that follow in this day and age that follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's the focus that I find in the Scriptures. And when people come to me and they ask me about the Lord's table and ask me about communion, they, they sometimes want to bring extra biblical ideas to the point. Things that the Bible doesn't specifically teach us. And what I find clearly recorded in Scripture is this point, is that God established these relevant reminders to encourage the faith of all those of us that follow Jesus. So that, that's what it's all about. Now, just a couple different thoughts on what are some relevant reminders in the Scriptures. Well, you know, it's funny. In my mind, I thought that there were a lot more than what there were. And maybe there are some that we could point out and say, well, this one, this one, or that one. But yet, these are the ones that I guarantee these are relevant reminders that God gave His people to encourage their, their faith. And, and a definition for it, it is a method of preserving the memory, of preserving that, of getting a picture of it in mind, of an important event that's designated by God. And let me just comment, I'm, I'm of, an, of, of a mindset that says, I want to make sure that the Bible teaches we do this rather than the history or the custom of the church teaching us to do this. There are a lot of customary things, a lot of traditional things. Why did Jesus butt heads so much with the Pharisees? Because they had added all kinds of things to what people practiced that weren't part of God's original plan. So therefore, what are the relevant reminders I find in Scripture? The Ark of the Covenant. It's a relevant reminder. And that was a very sacred thing. If you remember, people died because of the Ark of the Covenant. And when the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines, when it was stolen by the Philistines, what happened? They suddenly had strange things happening in their land. So the Ark of the Covenant was definitely a designation by God that was intended to remind His followers of something special that would encourage their faith. There were the 12 stones that were taken from the Jordan River. This happened after the thing we're going to study today. But the 12 stones that were taken... And these 12 stones were taken from the middle of the Jordan River. Why? Because when they crossed the Jordan River, they crossed safely on dry land. And they went back into the middle of the river. They, they crossed the, 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 the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, possibly millions of people from the Israelites, crossed the Jordan River and went into the promised land there in Joshua chapter 4. And Joshua says, oh, wait a minute, God just told me I'm going to send 12 of you back. One person from each tribe of Israel, go back and grab a rock. And it says that, that those 12 stones were there as a reminder. And it even says in the passage, it says, whenever your children ask you about the rocks, you tell them, hey, this is what God did. Isn't that exciting? Now, I could pause for a moment. In fact, I will. I guess I got that freedom. Do we have relevant reminders? And I, I, and I just said, don't do something if it's not biblical. Well, I think it is biblical to have certain events where God showed up in your life and say, remember the time that God did this? Remember the time? And when your kids ask about it, you can say, God is trustworthy. That's where the 12 rocks were. Now, the Passover feast, we're going to study that here in a few moments. 
That was a relevant reminder. And it was a very important relevant reminder. And then we have other feasts and Holy Day celebrations defined in Exodus and in Leviticus. There's a whole list of them there. I'm not going to go through the list. And finally, there's the Lord's Memorial Supper. And to some extent, that is the one thing that the Bible gives us as a church from the day of Pentecost till today. One thing the Bible gives us to be a relevant reminder that we continually celebrate. And it's interesting, the Bible never tells us to celebrate Christmas. It never says it in so many words that we celebrate Easter as a holiday. But it tells us that we should celebrate the Lord's Memorial Supper. And that's a relevant reminder. And that is very specifically tied to Passover. And I want us to see today the, the, the relationship between Passover and communion. And I'm going to try to, to do this in such a, a vivid hopefully clear way that we'll all leave say, okay, I get it now. I hope the kids understand better. I remember as a child, I, I'd watch four times a year, I'd watch as my mom and dad took communion, and uh, boy, that bread on that plate, it looks, in fact, it was cut so nicely, it looked like angel food cake. And I remember how I, you know, and, I, and, and you know what, my mom or my dad would slip me a mint because I was too young to understand. But there's a relationship between Passover and communion. Now, as we look at Passover, this is going to be from Exodus chapter 12 here in a few moments, when God rescued the Israelites from slavery, and we'll even show that here in a few moments. He rescued the Israelites from slavery. What did He do? He gave them a feast. And it was meant to be a feast. It was all the trimmings. It was a wonderful meal. It was nicer than Thanksgiving. He gave them a feast as a reminder. And let's look at the passage here. Put it on the screen. Now this day will be a memorial, it says. A memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. And it will be all throughout, throughout, your, all throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. As a permanent ordinance. We skip to a couple more verses later. It says, and you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you as He promised, you will observe this rite. And when your children say to you, what does this rite mean to you? What does this mean? When your children ask that, you shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord and get this, who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when at the same time he struck the Egyptians but spared our homes. You go on farther in the passages, and the people bowed low and worshipped. Then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Let me just comment, that's translated that way, that's recorded that way. The Hebrew language, when I talk about relevant reminders, one thing that I like about the Hebrew language, I, I, I just enjoyed so much when I studied Hebrew and I took those courses and got to know the language, it is a vivid pictorial language. Hebrew words are so descriptive and this passage is written in Hebrew grammar, so to speak, where he gets the point across. He says, notice the, the second line, then the sons of Israel went and did so. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Herod, so they did. 
And that's basically emphasizing the fact that they obeyed. They followed what God wanted them to do. And be, would it be so great if we would find Scripture and say, hey, I'm going to follow it exactly to the T. But going on, he says, it is a night to be observed for the Lord. What? For having brought them out of the land of Egypt, this night is for the Lord to be observed by all the sons of Israel throughout their generations. That's the passage. And I'm not going to make any comments. I'm going to let the, the Bible speak for itself. But now, what did God want the Israelites to remember? What was God's focus in this? What was the memory that He wanted them to have? What did they want them to remember? Well, this is from Exodus chapter 20. This is the Ten Commandments. This is the first of the Ten Commandments. This is right at the beginning. And notice it says, God spoke all these words, I, the Lord, am your God who brought you from the land of Egypt, from the house of slavery. And then he says that first command, you shall have no other gods before me. That's what God wanted the Israelites to remember. And he didn't want them ever to forget the fact that, hey, I should be central in your life. And I think that's a foundation for us as well that we should recognize that He is the God that brought us, as we'll see in this, out of the slavery of sin into the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. But as we see that, what was Israel's problem? Israel's problem, they were stuck in Egypt. And it's possible that some of the pyramids that we could see if we went over to Egypt some of those pyramids were very possibly built by the Israelites. They were built by the Israelites. And what was the Israelites' job? What were they slaves doing? They were making bricks. They were making bricks. And it says in the Scriptures that as they made bricks, that there were times when the Egyptians... See, what was in the middle of the bricks? There was some sort of fiber to hold them together. If you just take concrete and, 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 and put it out somewhere, if you don't put rebar, metal in it, that concrete's going to break up and, and it's, it's going to not last very long. And they were to put some sort of fiber in the bricks so that they'd stick together longer. And it says that there was a time when the Egyptian withheld the hay, withheld the fiber from the, from the Israelites, and made it so that the bricks didn't hold together. And what did they do? They would punish the Israelites because they were making poor quality bricks. So they were stuck in a bad place. And Israel's promise was, problem was they were in Egypt, the land of the pyramids. They were making bricks because they were forced to do so. Forced labor, slave labor. And they were suffering as slaves in Egypt. And as we look at Exodus one more time here, it says Israel's problem. Now, Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Moses, we know who Moses was. Moses was a Hebrew child born of Hebrew Israelite parents but yet, born at a time when what were the Egyptians doing? They were killing the young baby boys. Why? Because the Israelites were outnumbering the Egyptians, and the Egyptians were afraid of a revolt. So Moses is born, and he ends up being adopted by Pharaoh, or Pharaoh's daughter, by the king of Egypt. He ends up being adopted. Why? Because his mom saved him by putting him out in a little boat made of reeds. And yet, Moses was exiled. He ran from Egypt. Why? Because he defended one of his, his Jewish 
friends or somebody that was Jewish. He defended this person and in his defense, he killed an Egyptian and he got afraid because here he was, who's going to support me? And he ran. And he was out in the wilderness. He got married out in the wilderness. He was working for his father-in-law, pastoring his father-in-law's sheep, the priest of Midian. And it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a burning fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this marvelous light why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Here I am. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction. I've seen the suffering of my people, the Israelites, who are in Egypt. And let me just say, when God said that to Moses, the thought that should have cropped through Moses' mind is, they're your people, God, but they're also my people. He says, I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. So then he says, Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh. You're the man. So that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. So there's Moses. There's the burning bush. Did you ever have a bush talk to you? If you went home today and told your, your, your wife or your husband or told your kids or told some of your neighbor, you know, I talked today to a bush. What are they going to think about you? Well, as Moses gets this word from the burning bush, you know, Moses argued with God. He says, not me. I, I can't talk. But God says, no, you're the one. I'm sending you, Moses. I want you to go and you're going to rescue the Israelites. I'm sending you to rescue the Israelites, Moses. So Moses went and he began to deal with Pharaoh. What did God give him? He gave him ten plagues. He basically said, Moses, when you get there, when you're there, I'm going to afflict the the Egyptians with problems. And we go through the ten plagues, and what are they? First one was blood. You don't need to write this down. In fact, let me just comment here. I always make copies of my PowerPoint. Well, this morning, I um, forgot to change the settings on the printer. So therefore, you get copies in color today. That's not on purpose. That was a mistake. So the first nine people can get copies in color, then the rest of you get them in black and white. But the first of the plagues is blood. And basically, the Nile along with all the water in Egypt turned into blood. But that didn't convince Pharaoh. Pharaoh did not let the people go. The second one were frogs. Frogs covered the land. Frogs hopping all over the place. Frog legs. And basically, the frogs covered the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh, he says, you know what? Maybe I'll let you go this time. But he changed his mind. Thirdly, there were gnats. I'm told of of folks that live out near the, the lake that there's a time of the year where the the lake flies are just so thick you don't even want to go outside your house. And as far as that's concerned, I saw it because we we went to someone's home there and brought them a meal 
some time back, and we saw the thickness of the, the flies all over. And when we got in our car, they were all over. Can you imagine what it would be like to have gnats where the, literally the dust, the dust that blew in that sandy region turned to gnats and it covered the people and the animals of Egypt? And Pharaoh said, no, not going to let you go. After the gnats were the flies. The flies filled the houses of the land of Egypt. Once again, Pharaoh says, you know what? I'm softening. But nah, changed my mind, not going to let you go. Next, all the livestock of the Egyptians began dying. Their livestock started to die. And, and you know, you'd think that Pharaoh would, would give in then, but no, he didn't let the Israelites go. And then the boils. The people were infested with boils. The people and the animals both had boils. Pharaoh said no. So next you have hail. Can you imagine that in the middle of the desert? Got a hailstorm? And hail strikes down everything in the fields, the humans, the animals, the trees. Pharaoh, he asked for forgiveness. He said, well, I'm sorry. And, and he, he was seeking maybe to let the people go, but changed his mind. Said no. Then came the locusts. Last week we were down in where our daughter and son in law live in the Chicago suburbs. I took a walk in the morning and, and uh, it was raining for a little bit of time, but when it wasn't raining, I heard this humming in the trees. It was, it's, it's locust season down there. I don't know about locusts up here. I'm sure you get them. But they were loud and they were just humming away. And in this particular case, the locusts began to devour every tree and plant in the land of Egypt. Again, Pharaoh asked for forgiveness, but wasn't going to let the Israelites go. Finally, darkness covers the land. For three days it was dark. The sun didn't shine. Darkness covered the land. Pharaoh began to soften, but says, no, I'm not going to let you go. Pharaoh's heart was hard and he wasn't willing to let the people go. It's a tough situation. Probably not a lot different than what we find in different circumstances today where people get stubborn, people want their way, people want their control. And Pharaoh liked the fact that he had all this slave labor. So he wasn't going to let God's people go until the 10th plague, the Passover. And the Passover, God commanded very explicit, clear-cut instructions for the Israelites that they were to, to develop a celebration. And they were going to have the first celebration there in Egypt. They were going to take a lamb. And it says that each family was to take a lamb, and if your family was too small to eat a lamb, ask your neighbors to come. But they would cook this, roast this lamb, and they roasted it in a very specific manner. And in the process, they were to take a hyssop. It's a, it's a, a branch that could be used like a sponge. And they would take the hyssop and take and dip it in the blood of the lamb. And they were to mark the side posts of the door and the top of the door of their house. And as they did that, that was the sign that they were trusting in God. They were believing that God was going to do something great for them. Now, I wonder how many of the people did it because, well, we're supposed to do it. But the Scriptures tells us that every home where the blood was put that night when the angel of death came through Egypt, the homes where the blood was on the doorposts and at the top of the door, there was a Passover. Passed over that house. In the houses that were not passed over, the oldest son 
the oldest of the livestock. Once again, there was more livestock that the Egyptians had and, and, and the oldest of the li- They were all killed. Tragic. Difficult. And I just want to point out here, I want us to see a couple of things. God's provision for the Israelites that led to the release from slavery, it also brought judgment to Pharaoh and his people. And as the Israelites would celebrate year after year after year the Passover of how they were freed from slavery, of how they got out of Egypt, they were also celebrating, and get this, this is tough, they were celebrating the justice system of God. Because God was also bringing retribution upon the Egyptians. And I think it's important for us to take one look at another passage of Scripture. This is, I, I think it's good to tie things together. It's good to understand. Because Genesis 12, 1-3 explains God's promise to Abraham and to Israel. And notice the verses here. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go out from your country, your relatives, your father's household, to the land that I will show you, Canaan. Then I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be an example of divine blessing to everyone. I will bless those who bless you, but the one who treats you with contempt and curses you, I must curse. And all the families of the earth will bless one another by your name. Understand something. That's the beginning of the nation of Israel. And God promises to Abraham, everyone that blesses you and your people, your relatives, I will bless. Everyone that curses you, I will curse. The Egyptians cursed the Israelites. And as they celebrated, get this, it's a reminder, relevant reminder. As they celebrated their getting out of Egypt, God's justice system came into play. And there was judgment upon the Egyptians. And the Israelites were to remember that as well. It says it's a memorial that our homes were spared, but the Egyptians' homes were not. God's justice system should be something that we try to understand. And that's all involved. God's provision for His promise, the reminder of Passover was God's way of of helping His people remember His provision and His promises for them. It was his way of, remember, of helping his people to remember his provision and his promises for them. And this is a portrait of God's mercy, grace, love, and justice. The portrait of God's justice. God rescued Israel from Egypt, God redeemed Israel out of slavery. To redeem means to purchase, to purchase their right out of slavery. God purchased their right out of slavery by bringing justice upon the Egyptians. And God revealed His justice toward those who resist and reject His authority. Pharaoh rejected, he resisted. And God revealed His justice. And back to the passage where the Passover, it says, Now this will be a memorial to you and to those, you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. When your children say to you, What does this custom mean to you? You shall say, It is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when at the same time He struck the Egyptians but spared our homes. Now, let's understand this translates to this today. And when, God, when Jesus rescued us from slavery, 
when He rescued us from the slavery of sin, He gave us a feast as a reminder. He gave us a feast as a reminder. Once again, we see the bread and the cup. And I want to read through the passage in Mark and see what it says, explain a couple of things, and then we're going to celebrate communion. But in Mark 14, it says, On the first day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Jesus, where do you want us to prepare to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? Where do we do this? What are we going to do? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where's my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. The disciples went and came into the city and found it just as he told them. And they prepared the Passover. Now while they were eating, he took some bread. And after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, Take it. This is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. I'm skipping over to 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul, the Apostle Paul gives us instructions he says for i received from the lord that which i also delivered to you that the lord in the night in which he was betrayed took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and said take this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Some thoughts? What's our problem? Well, sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. We are trapped in slavery. The slavery of sin. Every person born. I, I was in my office yesterday in, in a counseling session with some folks and I shared the gospel. And I made a statement. I said, you know, every person ever born since Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, they were created as adults. Every person ever born since Genesis chapter 3, except for one, is born a slave to sin. That one person that wasn't is our Lord Jesus Christ. And our problem is that we need God to provide for us to help us overcome the problem of sin. We need God's help. And we know this, but yet I think sometimes it, it, it falls between the cracks and we, we just go on living life and we, we don't stop and realize the value of what Christ accomplished for us. I know most everybody in this room, if not everybody in this room, claims, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And yet, this relevant reminder that we have is intended to get our attention to keep us focused on the fact that God provided to help us to overcome the problem of sin. God sent Jesus to rescue us. He rescues us from the penalty of sin. He rescues us from the punishment for sin. And He rescues us from the power of sin. In the Lord's memorial feast is a relevant reminder. It's intended to encourage us to rely completely on the Lord. 
It's intended to enrich our relationship with the Lord, to make it richer, to make it more significant. And it's intended to emphasize our responsibility to tell others about what He's done for us. Just a couple more things that I want to cover here. Some applications, so to speak. As we integrate this feast into our daily lives, what difference does it really make? I I just want to comment and say there have been different times in my life, whether it be at, at a wedding in another church that I'm attending or a funeral in another church that I'm attending, where communion is sometimes given, the Lord's table is celebrated, and I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I have no right to be, I am not the, the judge. But yet, as I look and see, as, as I study people, as I consider what I see going on, I see so many folks going through the motions. And they've got this blank look on their faces, or they've got this, this sense of, well, I did my obligation. And I hope this is never looked at as an obligation. I hope this is never looked at as something that's a ritual. It is a relevant reminder. And therefore, what is a benefit? Why is it beneficial for us to celebrate? Three things. It is a reminder. It's a reminder. We've been saved by grace. Can I get an amen? We've been saved by grace. It's a reminder. The Lord Jesus died in my place. He died for me. He's my substitute. I'm a baseball fan. You all know that. He's my pinch hitter. And He always hits a home run. And I look at the passage in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. My favorite passage in the entire Bible. It says, for the love of Christ controls us. Since we've concluded this, we've come to this conclusion that Christ died for all. Therefore, all have died. And He died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. This is a reminder of that truth. Secondly, it should bring a sense of refreshment to the relationship we have with God. It gives us a a moment of refreshment. Not refreshment in the fact that we're eating and drinking something, but refreshment in the sense that it strengthens and encourages my faith. It emphasizes God's provision and promises in my life. And I'm reminded of the passage in John 14 where Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not let your hearts be distressed or lacking in courage. You heard me say to you, I'm going away And I am coming back. As often as you eat and drink this, you proclaim the Lord's death until He keeps His promise and comes back. Can I have another amen? Amen. Finally. It should motivate us to reach out to others who need to place their faith in the Lord. It should motivate us to reach out to those in our neighborhood, to those in our families, to those that surround us that desperately need to know Christ. And Jesus simply said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We need to go and make disciples of all nations. Let's pray. Father God, I pray now that as we el- the elders come and as we distribute the, the, the elements of your reminder to us today, I pray that this might refresh our faith. 
I pray that this might strengthen our relationship with You. And I pray that we might keep focused in the way that we ought upon our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank You for the truth of history of the Passover and what You did for the Israelites. And I thank You that Jesus Christ is our Passover. And I pray that as we worship today in these moments, You might strengthen and guide our lives, Father, in faith. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.